OK, hello everyone and good evening. My name is Deanna Sulky and I am a member of the Blue Water and District School Board ASD team. I'm here this evening with the rest of our team. Um, Shirley Chalmers, Deb Richardson and Anna Fuel. It is our privilege to welcome you here this evening to our ASD parent engagement session and uh, book club review. We have been reviewing The Autistic Brain by Dr. Temple Grandin. We are so extremely honored and ecstatic to have with us this evening, Dr. Grandin. On our behalf, on behalf of my team, we would like to, or we hope that you and your family are staying safe and healthy and feeling supported during this time. Just a couple housekeeping items. I know everyone is very excited to hear um, Dr. Grandin, so I'll keep it brief. Currently, everyone's mic is muted to eliminate any background noise and interference. We are recording uh, this evening to be able to save this for a later date and share with our families that we're unable to attend this evening. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we will do our best to monitor them. Without further ado, it is truly an honor to collaborate this evening with Dr. Grandin. She is one of the most accomplished and well-known adults with autism in the world. She is a world-renowned autism advocate, best-selling author, and distinguished speaker on autism and animal behavior. So uh, Dr. Grandin, we are so thrilled uh, to have you here this evening and welcome. Well, it's really great to be here. And I know you've got a wide range of uh, people here working with little kids all the way to adults, you know, going to the workforce. Um, one thing I was saying, a lot of my talks I'm is make a little short intro and then I want to just throw it open for questions because that's what I really like to do. Uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of early intervention, two year olds, three year olds. And now, of course, with COVID, it's very diff You know, a therapist has got to work one on one with a kid that's not going to work on a computer screen. Now, somebody on the computer screen can coach a parent or somebody else local that, to work with the child. Uh, but the worst thing you can do with two-year-olds that are not talking is to do nothing. And when I was a little kid, a lot of emphasis on how to wait and take my turn. Really, really important that you teach kids that. Um, now, one of the big things I emphasize in my book, The Autistic Brain, is when kids get a little older, um, autistic kids tend to be good at one thing, bad at something else. and I was a visual thinker. When I was about seven and eight, my ability in art started to show up. So my mother really encouraged my ability in art. But I would just do the same horse head over and over again. So she said, well, let's draw a saddle. Let's draw a stable. You know, you want to broaden it out. Um, but take that thing the kid's good at. Another kind of kid, they're the mathematics kid. They love patterns. That's not me. I could never could do algebra. Too abstract for me to understand it. Us visual thinkers, when we grow up, the kinds of things we'd be good at doing is auto mechanics, uh, skilled <laughs> trades, art, um, graphic design, those sorts of things. The mathematicians, it's going to be computer science, engineering, uh, physics. Those are some of the things the mathematicians are good at. And for the word thinkers, it's going to be writing, um, uh, speaking, uh, literary types of things. And But take the thing the kid's good at and build on it build on. Now, one of the issues that just came up, we just made national news last night because a three-year-old autistic kid was thrown off a of Southwest Airlines for not wearing a mask. And they had the CEO of Southwest Airlines on the TV last night, uh, you know, defending their policy. And I I've done a lot of work with big corporations. I have some sympathy for Southwest Airlines on some of these things. OK, we've gotten to the whole issue of dogs on airplanes. I got involved with the airline on some consulting on that. And then there was a dog that tore a guy's face off on, on Delta Airlines. It's not OK. But let's go back to, you know, the mask thing with a kid. Give them choices. Something that's a sensory issue is often much better tolerated. If the kid has some choices, give them some choices of masks and then practice wearing them long before you get to the airport and have some rewards for wearing it. And then something that was not tolerated, they can learn to tolerate it. Same thing with noise. There's been some good successes where a kid's scared to death of a vacuum cleaner and you let them play with the vacuum cleaner. Where they're turning it on and off, they might get to liking it because they control it. But it's always important to have some control. We don't just take any old mask and shove it at them. No, we're gonna get some choices of masks. And then 
and then you practice wearing them. And then it probably wouldn't have been a problem. And and uh, you find one that's nice soft fabric that's not scratchy. And then maybe what maybe a fun one you can go shopping online and find some fun ones that are animal mouths and things like that that are fun. But always have an element of choice. That helps because when the kid has some control, see when they're turning that vacuum cleaner on and off, they're controlling. That makes a lot of sense. And and um, and the rule they have the two year olds don't make them wear them. But uh, the research is really clear. What masks do is they prevent you from giving it to somebody else. That's where masks tend to work the best. And they, 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 they cut the transmission down about 30%, especially in indoor tight spaces. Actually, a plane is not as bad as something like a restaurant or a bar because you can turn the vents on. And... So that's, you know, that's some of the things you can do with sensory things. Um, you know, give the kids some choices of clothing. You know, you are going to wear pants. Well, we can go look at them, feel them find some that are soft. I have problems with itchy pants. There's some pants I can't wear. There's some pants I just gave them away because they itched. Oh, well, hopefully we're going to just get a bunch of questions going. Otherwise, I'll start talking a little bit about teaching working skills because they're totally different skills than, uh, than academic skills. And I'm seeing too many kids that sort of become their label. When I was out working in construction, you know, I worked on the Better Beef plant. That's got a center track restrainer that I designed. Two plants out in Alberta. I designed their handling facilities. And when I was out working on these kinds of projects, this would have been in the 80s and the 90s, I'm going to estimate that 20% of the welding people, skilled machinery designers, and drafting people were either autistic, ADHD, or dyslexic. And I am saying that seriously. The special ed department builds the stuff. And one of the worst things schools have done is taken a lot of these career relevant classes out. OK, one of you was telling me that your son was an auto technician. Well, he got exposed to that in in high school. That is a job that will never go away. That's not going to go away. You know, right now, because of COVID, the hospitality industry has been just ruined. Airlines are about bankrupt. Anything to do with travel and fun, sports, all shut off. Somebody's still got to fix cars. That's not going to go away. Absolutely. We do have a couple questions okay, here. Good. People. One of them is, what are some of the most effective ways to reduce anxiety at home and at day programs, including school? Well, one of the things with anxiety is surprises scare. And OK, back when we were going to the airport all the time, uh, let's say going through airport security. Don't have it be a surprise. You need to go online, look at the videos. So yes, the guards might touch you. You need to know about that kind of stuff up front. So it's not a surprise. Um, I had terrible problems with anxiety. Now, in my early 30s, I started taking antidepressant medication. And I discuss my experiences with antidepressants in my book, um, Thinking in Pictures. I have a whole chapter in Thinking in Pictures where I talk about anxiety. And I'm one of the people where medication saved me. Now, there's way too many drugs given out to little kids. But as I went through my 20s, my panic attacks got worse and worse. I had nonstop colitis attacks. Everything was going through me. And the HBO movie showed me eating yogurt and jello. Well, the reason why I did that is because everything went through me. I used to count calories to make sure I'd eat enough yogurt so I wouldn't starve. And then when I went on the antidepressant medication, the colitis almost cleared up. I still have a little bit of problems with it, but just about 90% of it cleared up because my nervous system was in a constant state of stress. And some people, a little bit of a low dose of an antidepressant. And even though thinking in pictures is now 25 years old, the information in there is still accurate. The big mistake with antidepressants, things like Prozac or something like that, fluoxetine, sertraline, is giving too high a dose. 
you have to, it, it, sometimes it's only half the starter dose. Because if you give too high a dose, you're going to get agitation and insomnia, and it's going to be worse. And I'm not, you know, like cannabis is legal now. I'm not that big a fan of pot. I've looked up some really, really bad stuff online just recently on what they call a paradoxical effect. And today's pot's like five times stronger than it used to be. And you can get a kind of an agitating effect where you get anxiety and paranoia. I, you know, if you get zonked out on it, I no antidepressant drugs, low dose, best thing, best thing to use. And they totally saved me. And I know other people that um, uh, went on it and I, I wouldn't be functioning a day. First of all, I would have fallen apart from stress related health problems. The other thing that helps is lots of exercise, lots of exercise. I do uh, 100 sit ups. Now it's like kind of modified push-ups I do because I had sciatic problems, but I do a hundred of those every night, I despise every single one of them. But I find that that burst of hard exercise is the thing that really helps. You know, walking around, I mean, I added up how much I walked in the airport. That didn't do it. And actually, I haven't walked in an airport since March 12th. So I walk around my condo complex now. It's a quarter of a mile. Yeah, I need to do that for my back, but a burst of hard exercise. Now, you're not going to do 100 sit-ups overnight. That took six months to work up to that. You don't want to have a heart attack by trying to do that too quickly. But it only takes a couple of minutes to do them. And that burst of hard exercise makes a difference. That makes total sense. Thank you. Um, another question is, what is the most important message you have for parents and students um, without with and without degrees um, or forms of autism to better bridge their relationships with one another? Well, I had friends who shared interests. Friend, you know, when I was in high school, I got bullied and teased. It was horrible. I was called tape recorder and because I always use the same phrases. And I had friends where we rode horses, friends at the model rocket club, friends at electronics. You know, for some other kid, it could be robotics. You know, it could be art. It could be a lot of different things. You know, right now, because of COVID, we're doing lots of outdoor activities. They're tubing, uh, taking plastic float things and going on the river with them. And fortunately, that's not been a source of, of infection. You're outside and you're constantly moving. You know, we've had infection here in Fort Collins, but I haven't heard of any infection coming from the river. It's been restaurant staff, the whole restaurant staff gets of it and more of that kind of stuff. Uh, but get a, you know, shared interests. I'm a big fan of... Uh, you know, you can get together and, you know, I have friends that we can talk about autism. We also can talk about animal behavior or building things. Those are things that I find real interesting. Now I'm not hearing you. Oh, sorry. That yeah, that was me. Sorry, Temple. I had I, my uh, my mute off. It's just a reminder to everyone to turn off your cameras and to mic your mukes, please. Not you, Temple. <laughs> okay. We, we want to hear everything you're gonna say. Okay. Um, the question in the chat box, and okay. I'm just trying to see here because I have some a glare from the sun. Um, I can read it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Shirley. Um, I have a question. Uh, Jody Lynn has said, I have a question about masks for students that Temple already touched on, but my worry is that students will be missing facial cues and expressions. Oh, that's one of the problems in autism. That'll be from, that'll be from Chris. Well, Sorry. that's the social. It's from Christine. You know, the very subtle facial cues, they don't pick up. You see, that's the problem. Social behavior has to kind of be learned like acting in a play. And I had to learn that, no. My when I was in high school, I went on and on and on talking about the stupid carnival ride. And other kids got sick of talking about this carnival ride just over and over and over again. Mrs. Chalmers, is there any more questions in the in the sidebar? Not in the sidebar, but oh. is there any one strategy that you would give parents of kids with ASD that um, you can think of that would um, be beneficial? Well, we get too hung up on the ASD because when I go out to Silicon, I've been out to Silicon Valley. I've been to Google. I've been to Microsoft who brought you this program. Um, many of the tech companies, 
And you go out there and those programmers are all on the spectrum. Now they're milder end of the spectrum. Most of them would have had no speech delay, which I had speech delay. And and I worked with a lot of skilled trades people and drafting and design people, uh, professionals that I think were undiagnosed people with uh, with autism on the milder end of it. And and uh, they way they got you know the way they got jobs is they were good at what they did, extremely good at drafting and design. Bad extremely good at Top building foods, you know, whatever the whatever the thing was, they became extremely good. And and, you know, I you see, I don't get I find the verbal thinkers tend to get hung up on the labels. I see the kid and I'm going this 12 year old kid's a junior edition of somebody I saw at a tech company. Well, and then nobody thinks to introduce programming to them. They're not going to learn programming if somebody doesn't introduce it. Or you've got a little kid that's uh, good at math. Well, don't make them do the baby junk. Give them hard math. Teach them how to do JavaScript and tell them that the Dragon spacecraft, that the displays run on JavaScript. Isn't that cool? That you could make those displays on the on the Dragon spaceship. There's stuff online where you can do that. Now, programming's not for me. I would just know how to find the stuff. You just type in Dragon spacecraft, JavaScript programs. People lots of times just don't think to look for cool things they can find that are right online. So if the kids are at home right now, um, well, these are math teachers, let them learn JavaScript. Or or they can learn gardening or they can learn some other thing. That makes a lot of sense. We have um, a question from Christine. She says, um, my sister gets anxious when required to put her arms in sleeves. She likes to have her arms out of her sleeves, sleeves and tucked up under her shirt. Her hands have small objects she carries around. Her wrists, she wears bracelets and on her hands, biking gloves. Things she has made up for herself to maintain control so she doesn't engage in SIB. Is there a way to help her not be anxious and keep her hands out of her shirt and her sleeves. You know, you know what leotards are like for ballet? Mm -hmm. They're kind of tight garments. I wonder yeah. if she'd like that under her clothes. That's a simple thing to try. I'm not going to say it's absolutely going to work. Yeah. It's something you could try because it would kind of make pressure over the body. Mm -hmm. You know, and get a leotard that's got long sleeves and see how she likes it. Make sure it's washed so it's not scratchy. It's really soft. Uh, and she might really like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a question from Rebecca. What are some things we can do to help out with shutting down in class? Well, sometimes it's sensory overload. You see, and the problem you've got with all these sensory issues is they're so variable. Like mine right now, I've got some minor sound sensitivity and I can't stand scratchy clothes. I'd call my sensory issues now a nuisance. Basically, if I'm in a noisy restaurant, I can't hear. I, I can tolerate the noisy restaurant, but I absolutely cannot hear the conversations. Well, that doesn't make dinner very much fun if I can't hear the conversations. And I've never been able to hear the conversations if there's too much background noise. And then you have people where they get in a noisy restaurant and it's really painful and it's just horrible sensory overload. There's other people that have visual processing problems. When they go to read, they look at white paper with black print. They see the print kind of wiggle on the page. You know, can help that colored paper, light tan paper, try lavender, light blue, different gray, different colored papers. Let the kid pick out the paper. Um, that can sometimes help with reading problems caused by visual processing problem. Doesn't work for everybody. But you're talking colored paper here and it's nothing, nothing expensive. And, um, you know, it's something that for certain kids, it might be helpful. It might not be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have one from Lori. How do we work on separation for school and knowing that it's OK that mom will be there after? I think a lot of our um, our uh, kiddos are going to be a little anxious about going to school. And uh, yeah, what's your suggestion on well, that? Go back to school and the desks are all fall apart. Maybe they got plastic partitions between them or some other weird thing. Uh, the, the best thing is try to not have it be a surprise. OK, this is the way the desks are going to be. You know, you're going to eat your lunch at your desk. Um, 
you know, so you don't get COVID. And maybe, you know, visit the school, show them pictures of it. They might stagger the classes where you're online one day and in line at uh, home, your school one day, and then at home. What we're going to be doing right now, I just got a seating chart for our graduate students. And like, if you're green, you come in and at these days, the desks have been rearranged or the name cards on the desk have been rearranged. So there's always a space between the desks. And then the next day, the other set of graduate students can come in. I just got that last night. That was in one of the emails, the seating chart for graduate student offices for social distancing. You know, so you're going to have that kind of changes. The other thing was, well, you also got to, you know, teach more independence. I'm seeing kids like fully verbal, smart kids where they've never gone shopping by themselves. They're not, they never learned to have so little money, save the little allowance to buy things. I was taught that for a young age. They aren't doing enough of those basic little skill things. You know, we ran a lemonade stand when we were kids. And that's when I learned that Kool-Aid had to have a lot of sugar and we ran out of sugar. So we had some supply chain management issues with that. <laughs> that's what we had with that. There's a question in the box here from um, Trudeau. Uh, which schools, not, with schools not telling us exactly what is going to be happening for they our don't children? Know. They don't know. Because we just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, they've got a lot of things set up at CSU. they got a dorm they're going to use as a quarantine dorm. And the problem is they don't know. Um, Deb, you have a question. You know, and that just makes more uncertainty. Uh, you know, and a lot of kids miss their friends. And what some families have done here is they set up like quarantine pods. And I've seen them put some umbrellas out under the trees. And there'll be two families getting together outside. And their kids are playing. They got a plastic wading pool and the kids are splashing around in that and doing little games on the sidewalks and stuff. You know, families are trying to, you know, do summer camp in the backyard with maybe one other family. We've got some of that going on now, just right where I live. Mm -hmm. um, Melanie has a question. Do you have methods on how to improve concentration and focus, especially with so much technology in schools, home, adverting attention away from studying? Well, first of all, OK, there's technology used for like we're talking right now, mm -hmm. but the idle video game playing, video watching, we've got to limit that. And then I also one uh, one thing's interesting. Amazon sold out on jigsaw puzzles. And board games. OK, and I, and I think that's good that people want to do some other activities that weren't tech. And I think that's a good thing that they were doing something that wasn't tech. I agree. And and some families have, have set up like tents in the backyards for backyard camp out. Uh, you know, we need to just get a little more resourceful. I'm seeing the dogs here in Fort Collins have never had it better. They're getting so many walks. <laughs> I go Same out here. and I walk around my condo <laughs> uh, at my the condo complex I'm in and I uh, I've gotten to know some of the people that that have their dogs. And one lady's a social worker. I've got to make sure I socially distance from her. Um, we talk all the time, but she gets a lot of exposure. They, the way they've been doing her is she goes out and does five days of work and then she's sent home for seven days. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, we have one from um, from Jenny. What would hand sucking indicate? My son who is six has been doing it for three years from fingers to knuckles all the way to his wrist. He is nonverbal, has Down syndrome and J fed. What can I do to help? Well, maybe we can give him something else to suck on. He's probably in, <coughs> an injures skin if he <coughs> do, does that too much. Um, I'd recommend, you know, getting some advice from an OT that's trained in sensory integration. Um, a lot of these kids are, are sensory seekers and sometimes um, you know, deep pressure can be helpful. 
activities involving balancing and swinging. And the thing is, you try these things, and some kids they work, for others they don't. Um, one of the things that, that's a mistake that people make is one size does not fit all. You could try some deep pressure stuff and see if that works. Like I mentioned, getting a leotard uh, shirt with the long sleeves. She's either going to love that shirt or hate it. And you don't know until you try it. But it's not a very expensive thing. And it's certainly not a dangerous thing. Leotard are, you know, common things. And she doesn't like it. You can give it to some other kid. You know, it's something that you can try. And she might just love it having that pressure on her body and then on her arms too. And then she put a shirt on with sleeves and may not bother her. Yeah. I like to figure out simple stuff we can do. There's a lot of people out there selling a lot of really complicated stuff. Now I'm going to met shameless book promoter. This is my book, the, uh, uh, the way I see it. It's my most basic book with a lot of little short chapters. I'm a shameless book promoter. Here's my kids project book, alternatives to computers. Things like uh, making a paper snowflake called Calling All Minds. We've got kids today that have never cut out a paper snowflake. Yeah. When I gave a book signing for this book, uh, now two years ago, about one third of the kids in a suburb of Denver had never made a paper airplane. So I've got real simple projects. I mean, these are things, there's projects in there that kids can do. I'm finding a lot of kids that are really good with Legos and nobody thought to introduce tools. I was using pliers and screwdrivers in about second grade. Then I was taught how to use them safely. And so were the other kids in the neighborhood. That wasn't just me. Deb has a question. Hey guys. Um, Temple, I had a question. So when we're working with um, teachers and other educators in the class, I just wondered if you could talk about your feelings in redirecting self-stim behaviors like hand flapping or sounds within the class or just other um, stim behaviors that teachers may see. I know a lot of times they ask, what do we redirect and what do we allow well, time for students to engage in? Well, one of the reasons why kids stim is it calms them down. That's why they stim. And I had some times of day where I was allowed to stim. Like in my room, was, in my stimming was mostly spinning things and and uh, twirling and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I was given some time to do it. You can give kids some time to do it. And, and, and then there's other times you don't do it. And some kids, before they can concentrate at all, need a little break sometimes to do a little stimming. Now, the thing that's the most disruptive is when they make sounds. OK, if you just hand flaps, well, that doesn't bother other people. Uh, you see that again, this is something that's very, very variable. And this is where a lot of the things the occupational therapists do in sensory integration can be helpful. And the Ayers sensory integration methods now are evidence based. The brand new paper that came out just about a little over a year ago about that. There was a meta analysis of a whole bunch of different studies. And it's sensory stuff is finally getting recognized as part of an evidence based program. It's not the whole program. One of the big problems we got people get way too single minded on stuff. And they've got the magic service. Yes, I'm bad about selling books. Yeah, I'm a shameless book promoter, but I, I am not connected to any services of any kind. And in the in uh, in my books, uh, I, things I promote are just stuff you regular stuff you can buy. Well, we love your books, Temple. We, uh, Mrs. Chalmers, do you have any more questions in the chat box? I do. Um, how do I help my senior high school students deal with the pressures and challenges? Um, for example, emotional or sexual of being a teenager, especially, especially the desire to fit in. Well, and then teenage boys do risky things and the brain is not all the way mature. I get science and nature and they had a picture in there that would make any parent cringe. There was two warehouses with a six foot gap between the roofs with a teenage boy in midair between the roofs. Uh, 
that's not where a parent wants their kid to be. And if I own those warehouses, I'd be having a heart failure at that. Like, no, I don't want them up there. You know, and this is one of the problems. Teens doing risky behavior uh, in order to, to uh, you know, show off to their peers. Uh, when it comes to sex, one of the things is you got to tell them what the rules are and tell them to just straight. You know, that's uh, what, what, what's legal, what's not. You know, when they get a little older, they don't want to end up in the sex offender list. And in the U.S., at least, the rules vary depending upon the state and how much trouble you can get into. Um, this, for, um, uh, there's a really good book by a lady named Chantel, C-H-A-N-T-E-L, C -H -A -N -T -E -L, Cecile Kira. And even when I spell it wrong on Amazon, I managed to find it after I type autism next to it. Chantel Cecile Kira. She's got some very good uh, stuff on this. And then I have another book, The Unwritten Social Rules. And I co-authored it with Sean Barron. And we've got kind of different approaches, you know, to the issue. And a lot of counselors for teenagers and young adults find that book real helpful. Uh, you see, a lot of the questions we've been getting are very, very general. Uh, you see, the problem we've got with autism, you have this huge spectrum that goes from Silicon Valley programmer, okay, to somebody who's got much more challenges, uh, nonverbal with other medical problems on top of the autism. And it all has the same name. Well, it, it doesn't make too much sense to have all the same name. And then I'm seeing the kid that's just sort of geeky and nerdy. That would be the junior edition of some of the people I've worked with in construction. And he's addicted to video games instead of out fixing things. And we've got a gigantic shortage right now, skilled trades. I was just talking to a guy. We have one company in the U.S. that still builds chicken processing equipment. And all the rest of it's coming from Europe. We're getting chicken processing plants right now in 100 shipping containers from Europe. And the reason for that is we took out skilled trades out of the high schools 25 years ago, and we're paying for it. Now, Quebec, Canada still is making some equipment. And that's because they kept the skilled trades. Now, I've been through four big new processing plants, poultry and pigs, in the last three years, checking nameplates on equipment. And I'm seeing how this relates back to decisions made in our educational system, and I think we're just flat wrong. And and the thing is, Europe's a high wage uh, country. It isn't like making clothing in a low wage country. High wage country costs a fortune to ship that stuff over here. I was just talking to a guy today, and they want to put a maintenance contract on it. That's just unbelievable. Uh, no, you're kind of weird kid. That's kind of weird. He's the guy that will invent the next piece of clever equipment. I call it the clever engineering department. <laughs> and we've lost that, those skills. We don't make elevators, ski lifts, a lot of different stuff. Uh, we have a question from Angela. Any tips on safety regarding flight risk, locks on doors, running away, but still trying to encourage independence, nonverbal, fast, strong seven-year-old? Well, have you ever tried rewarding them for not running away? You know, sometimes you can get behavior that gets really bad and taking away an iPad or something like that doesn't work because the behavior is so frequent. But sometimes the thing to do is he gets a reward if he goes 30 seconds and doesn't run off. And then you gradually lengthen it. You know, we do that, okay, with cattle. When you get really pushy behavior around gates, it gets really dangerous. Or if somebody's on a quad uh, a quad bike, there's supplements on the back of it, and cattle are pushing and shoving. Well, if you throw the feet out there when they're pushing and shoving, you reward it pushing and shoving. So what I tell people to do is wait until they just stand back for a second, and then you throw the feet out there. Reward, reward little bits of the behavior you want. That's something that might work. Um, then there's some kids that just need a place to run. I went to a program that um, a very good program uh, for adults that had, had a lot of issues. And they were telling me about one teenage boy they got 
binders this thick full of behavior plans that did not work. The kid liked to run. So they gave him a place to run. That was marked. Then um, they also gave him some work that was real work. Stacking wood, which was real work. Fake work, they know the difference between fake work and real work. And a lot of the behavior problems went away. And then he wanted to run, he had this one place where it was marked where he could run. So you, first of all, you had to figure out what's triggering the running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What sets it off? You might have noise sensitivity. So he wants to just get away. And then there's often problems with not understanding safety. You know how I learned about car, not running out in front of cars? This was a teachable moment. We're out for a walk and there was a dead flat squirrel on the road. And that's what happens to you when a car hits you. That was pointed out to me. Then I understood why you don't want to get hit by a car. That's a teachable moment. Mm -hmm. Or the big mistake is made, let's say we're at the table, we're trying to get the kid to have manners and he's sticking his hands in the mashed potatoes. Instead of screaming, no, say use the fork. Give the instruction instead of screaming, no. No, especially if it's not something dangerous, like running in the street. Mm -hmm. You know, he's uh, stirring his drink with his finger or whatever. You just say, use the spoon. You give the instruction. That's what you do. Amazing. Um, Mrs. Chalmers, another question? Um, it's a comment, really. Um, Jeannie says, have, has wants to ask you if you've ever met people that see words that constantly come across their mind. She's a visual person and visualizes like you, Temple, but okay. others in her family see words all the time, constantly. Well, it's just different ways that people think. You see, the object visualizer, that's me, sees pictures in their minds, and as she explained in my book, Thinking in Pictures, then you got the mathematical mind, they tend to see patterns in things. It's all about patterns. And a lot of the mathematical kids have some trouble with reading, and then you've got word minds and you get somebody on the spectrum. The skills tend to be more uneven, good at one thing, terrible at something else. And we need to have a lot more emphasis on building up the area of strength, whatever it is. Something then turn it into a career because the way I used to sell jobs is I had a portfolio of drawings and pictures of projects and I would just show my portfolio to people. That's how I sold the jobs. Within the current COVID-19 context, do you have any, uh, any advice on how we can help students maintain their physical personal boundaries? And how can we help students maintain social distancing when it's something they have always struggled with, even pro-COVID? Well, I don't know, regular people struggle with social distancing. You know, when I go out for my walk around the condo, I got people who want to talk about it to remind you social distancing. OK, and the lady that does the social work, I found out she just gets sent home to quarantine for seven days. I've got to stay 10 feet away from her outside. I'm still going to talk to her, but we are going to social distance. And and I'm, I'm 73 years old. I don't want to get COVID. But on the other hand, I can't stop living. Yes, and I am going to talk to that lady because she has a dog and walks it. And I have petted her dog. Now I just found out dogs get COVID. <sighs> Well, maybe I'm not, maybe I shouldn't pet her dog. But it, it's, uh, you, we've got to figure, you know, they're going to have all this weird stuff going on at school, and I think everybody's going to get infected again, is what I think is going to happen. I mean, we've got to find treatments, we've got to find vaccines. And the problem we've had with our research is they just research expensive stuff. I read some stuff that maybe tuberculosis vaccine might have some effect. That should have been researched by now. Does tuberculosis vaccine actually work? Well, we should by now have known either yes or no. It's not been researched because nobody's going to make any money on some old generic vaccine. There's also, you know, there's some other vaccines for other things that might possibly, you still would get COVID, but stop the severe stuff. And nobody has knuckled down and just researched some of the cheap stuff that might work. Also some treat medicines that might work. Yeah, I am concerned because I want to get severe COVID and crow. 
we don't want that either. No, um, I definitely don't want that. No, absolutely not. Uh, Natasha is, um, her question is, is it common for a child to feel um, that they wish they were never born during a meltdown? Any suggestions on how to deal with this other than telling them how important and loved they are? Well, first of all, wait until the meltdown's over. When I had a meltdown, mother would put me in my room, and after I calmed down 20 minutes or so, she'd say, now you can join the family and there'll be no television tonight. And, you know, I, my meltdowns weren't that frequent, maybe two or three a semester that were really bad at school. So I mainly lost maybe two or three nights a semester of TV. I mean, you, if you get to the point where you've taken the iPad and the computer and everything away, you no, know, then you have to start doing the other kind of thing where you reward them for going longer and longer periods of time, not doing some of the stuff. Um, no, you wait until they calm down. Before, don't try to talk to them in any way when they're having a meltdown. Mother never screamed at me and said, I'm going to take the TV away right when I was having a meltdown. No, you wait until they calm down and then you talk. And that's going to take 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, Sarah has a question. Can you talk about any helpful strategies for communicating with nonverbal children to assist them with making friendships with peers? OK, first of all, I need to know the age. But let's say you've worked really hard on the early intervention or early intervention. The kids like sex and doesn't talk. Um, you know, sign language is a good thing. But the problem with sign language is the other peers aren't going to know it. But how about text messaging on an iPad? Typing text. I had a chance to go visit a large corporation and I had dinner with a deaf person that did computer work uh, for a large company. And we had dinner and the way I don't know sign language. So we were passing a phone back and forth text messaging. We didn't send the texts, but we just passed the phone back and forth using the text messaging just showing the oh, phone the oh. phone back the phones back and forth and i could do that with them and the phones are awfully little so i think it's better to use an ipad see if you can teach them how to uh, how to type on an ipad or a communication device where there's some um uh, it has uh, symbols and stuff on it and pictures on it that talks there's a lot of stuff there's also um a text to talk programs. I'm, you know, there's a lot of super expensive stuff too. But I would say let's just start with an iPad, just plain old text messaging, put it in airplane mode so they can't send them. And they can pass the iPad back and forth. Because there's a there's a number of nonverbal people that can learn to type. And they can learn to type independently. And it may start out that you got to hold their wrist originally. But until you get your hands off of them, and you also have to get your hands off of the device, iPad, or even if it's a piece of cardboard with letters on it, you can't touch that either because of queuing. But there are people that can type completely independently, and they describe a sensory disordered jumbled world. And a really good book that you can get pick up online is Tita Muckapadahe, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? And then there's a sequel to the reason I jump. It's like fall down five times, get up seven times. It's the sequel. And it's a better book because Noki's older. And he talks about that he couldn't control his movements. He was sort of like a broken robot that he could not control. Um, and these are people have a good brain inside in a very dis in a, in a, in a, in a, they can't control their movements. The eyes are giving all kinds of jumbled up stuff like a really bad satellite dish pixelation or really, really bad internet connection. And, and some of these guys can learn to type uh, and they can learn to type completely independently, but they will describe tremendous efforts required to screen out the background uh, noise. You might also want to look at Carly Fleischman in, from Canada. She's got uh, some blogs and, and there's a book called Carly's Voice. Mm -hmm. And she describes being in a restaurant and then all of a sudden the dishes rattled too much and she went sensory overload and shut down. Well, if you have an individual that remains nonverbal, I think those books are must reads. And these are people that type completely independently. But I've seen somebody take a this is just a cardboard off the back of a legal pad. 
but let's say this had letters on it. I've seen somebody holding this thing while the person type moving this thing. Well, that's queuing. You can't touch the device. I don't care if it's cardboard with letters on it or it's some kind of a computer. I, you, you, they finally got to get to where you don't touch the person or the whatever it is they communicate on the device. Mm. No, I saw a lady out in California. She was moving this thing like this while the person was typing on it. So it's queuing. But on the other hand, there's some people that think they're all completely, completely, uh, very, you know, totally intellectually retarded. That's not true. You know, some of these nonverbal people have, it's like a locked in syndrome. They got a good mind and they're trapped in a body that they can't control. Um, and the reason why they smell and touch stuff is because those senses still work. That's why they smell and touch everything. Those senses will still give some accurate information. Makes a lot of sense. Um, Janet asks, how do I help my grade 12 son find his interest? That could lead to a career. He has social anxiety. Well, you have to go out and try stuff. Like I, I, uh, I was f uh, 15 and I got the opportunity to go to my aunt's ranch and I was afraid to go. If I hadn't gone to my aunt's ranch, I wouldn't have been in the cattle industry. It's that simple. You've got to get out and try some stuff. And mother gave me a choice. I could go for a week and come home or go all summer. Not going wasn't one of the choices. They've got to try stuff. So the first thing I'm gonna to try to figure out, do you think he's a math kid, a, a picture thinking kid, a word kid? Um, um, a picture thinking kid, has he been introduced to tools? Well, you don't know if you like tools if you haven't tried them. You don't know if you like watercolor paints if you haven't tried them. See, this is where kids haven't tried enough stuff. Um, I was, saw a thing on 60 Minutes about a musician, um, the little baby was born very premature and totally blind, and the parents put musical stuff on all his toys. And then when he was three, they gave him a little keyboard and he immediately played Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Now, if he hadn't been exposed to the keyboard, he had phenomenal talent. But if he hadn't been exposed to the keyboard, you wouldn't know that he could play the music. Somebody handed his, his parents handed him a keyboard and he immediately figured out how to play it. Now, when I was a little kid, I had a recorder that you little flute. Yeah. I could never figure out how to play it. <laughs> I had piano lessons. That was useless. That wasn't for me. But you don't know until you expose kids to stuff. Yeah. No, they've got to get exposed to enough stuff so they can find and figure out something they might like. Yeah. Um, Shirley, another question? Um, Anna would like to know, you've published a number of wonderful books for adults about your studies on autism. What prompted you to write for children? Well, because I saw all these kids just um, glued to computers, so I did Calling All Minds with all, it's my childhood projects, parachutes, bird kites, and I actually, uh, Betsy, my editor, and I actually went out and made this stuff in the backyard and <laughs> did some of it. And I finally got this stupid air helicopter thing to fly, and I was as happy as I was when I was a little kid. <laughs> um, and then I got another book coming out called Outdoor Scientist, which is basically, um, you know, looking at stars, uh, tracking satellites, uh, animal behavior, do an animal ethogram, you know, go watch a squirrel and find out what it does for two hours. Just, again, and it's not stuff that's expensive. In fact, bird watching has gotten real popular. Mm -hmm. uh, hiking is very popular here with COVID all the outdoor things because those are things that people can do and not get sick so that the outdoors are rafting the rafting company's doing a great business they leave all the windows on the bus open let you blow away on that bus blow the covid <laughs> by, uh, viruses out of it that's how you keep them getting sick on that bus you open up every single window it's not very comfortable but that's how you not get sick uh, Roma um, asks, our son can't stand when somebody sings around him. Do you have any suggestions? That's sound sensitivity. You know, what might help that would be getting a high fidelity recording. It's got to be a really quality recording where you don't clip out the high frequencies, where he can turn it on and play it. Again, the control. 
the control. Um, the, uh, uh, I was just reading a thing that Deborah Moore wrote that kid didn't like dog barking. And so she made up this game of barking dogs where he, they pretended they were barking dogs and, and making those same noises. And then they got less afraid of it. You know, but again, he'd be turning the singing on and off. I'd get the kind of singing, you know, and then I have some other music on there too. But there's also a paper called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. And what you do in this is you stimulate two senses at the same time, like touch and smell. And it uses simple stuff like aromatherapy stuff, warm and cold spoons, cold water glasses, carpet samples, uh, uh, you know, a lot of touch stuff, um, classical music CD. Now it would be streaming CD, same thing. And you and you and they were doing 15 minutes twice a day of uh, two senses stimulated at once. And they seem to be make some differences. Three studies now use the keywords on Google, autism, environmental enrichment. Perfect. Um, Jenny has a question. What is the simplest augmentative communication app that she could start for her son? Um, he is starting to pick up on some augmentative uh, communication and his love for his iPad. I think they could really help. And I'll be perfectly honest, I'm not up on all the apps and they keep changing all the time. I think the best thing to do is uh, get into some parent groups and, and talk to people to try different things. I mean, there's Pro Logo to go. That's been around for a long time. There's a lot of stuff that's super expensive. Um, I would just talk around locally because that's the kind of thing when new stuff is coming out all the time. And you got to remember that when you search for things, the ads come up first. Mm -hmm. And and um, but they are marked as ads and and see what other people are using there's a lot of stuff that's super expensive i get a lot more interested in things that aren't so expensive text messaging for example <laughs> which i found worked really well um when we had dinner with the with the deaf uh, computer person and we just took a phone and passed it back and forth we never sent them texts we just passed the phone back and forth that's a great idea. That was simple. It is. It's fabulous. Um, Sarah, how can I help my five-year-old nonverbal student who has a device to talk um, how to share with his peers? He gets very upset when someone touches something he is playing with. Well, this is the turn-taking. This is why when I was a child, there was so much emphasis on turn-taking at games. And, and then you see then you might take turns playing with a toy. And you got a little kid that's twiddling a penny round and round and round or some other coin round and round. Well, then then you try to get them to take turns. I get to spin it. Now you get to spin it. We've got to work on turn taking. That that and and even back in the in night would have been like 1950 when I was. Uh, uh, 1949 when I got into therapy, I uh, lost speech therapy, so some ABA like stuff. And then the other big emphasis was games where there was turn taking. Huge emphasis on that when I was a young kid. And then a lot of emphasis on table manners. Shirley? It is just a comment. Um, Chris is just commenting about back to nature and enjoying animals, trees, streams, and plants. It's wonderful outside in nature. Kids love it with adults well that's something you can do that during covid absolutely and boy i can tell you here in colorado there's a river and i drive by and the parking lot full and i see families go, uh, they call it tubing they got a either an old uh, tractor tire tube or you now they buy plastic ones and they go float on the river and I think it's been a really safe activity and I don't the outbreaks we've had here in Fort Collins they came out of bars and restaurants not not going on the river oh 
Oh, uh, we had just had one come in the in the chat box. As an adult, what do you still struggle with at times, and what are some of the strategies you use to help yourself? Well, I have still have problems with multitasking. Like when we were having problems with getting Microsoft Teams to work, I was getting frustrated because I couldn't hear you on the cell phone. Uh, multitasking is still an issue. I cannot multitask. I also have no working memory. Anytime that there's a task where there's sequence, I have to write it down. If if there's more than three steps, I have to write it down. I need a pilot's checklist. I have to have that. Those are things I still have problems with. You know, and I found that business social is a whole lot easier than personal social. You know, business stuff I understand just fine. Um. There's been some, um, can you just touch again on, um, in the book, you talk about the different kinds, your visual thinker, your math thinker. Okay. Yeah. Do you mind just touching on that? I um, I really took a lot from that, from the book, and I just wanted to, I know some of our, um, some of our parents didn't have the opportunity to read the book. So if you don't mind just touching on that, that would be appreciated. Well, that was in the autistic brain. And yes. since the autistic brain was published, there's been more studies backing up the idea of these different kinds of thinking, which I'm real happy about. But basically, the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, shows how I think visually. That's accurate. It shows how I think. Also, the projects are all real. And, and pictures flash into my head. And I can't do algebra because there's nothing to visualize. Well, I think one of the things that need to be done there is skip algebra and go straight to geometry. Don't keep a kid out of auto mechanics class because he can't do algebra. You don't need algebra for auto mechanics. But then you take a kid that's a math kid. He's going to love algebra. But not the way they teach it now. I went and looked up the new core curriculum, the U.S. first, second and third grade math lessons. And I'm going, you got to be joking. Uh, a math kid's going to hate that. You want to give them an algebra book, you get an old fashioned algebra book. That's just numbers. Math kids don't want all that verbal garbage in their math. Go up in the attic and find an ancient algebra book. Maybe that's something that for a certain kid, you give them that. It's a pathway to a career. Get them in a programming class online. But you've got to expose them. If you keep doing baby math, he's just going to turn into a big behavior problem. And then maybe there's a literary kid. A mother would um, read things to us like Dickens, and she'd only read parts of it. But, you know, really good literature. She'd read out loud to us when we were like seven, eight, nine years old. And she'd pick through it, and then she'd summarize what she considered the boring parts. Again, that's exposure to literature. Makes a lot of sense. Mrs. Chalmers? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, put something in the box there first, so now I just got to find Sarah's question. Can you talk about any helpful strategies for communicating with nonverbal children to assist with making friendships with peers? Well, they're going to make friendships through doing something together. Some of this nonverbal kid might be good at a sport. That's something he can do with another kid, or maybe he's going to be bad at sports. But some kind of a shared interest. I went to a camp in Kearney, Nebraska, and I was supposed to, it's out in the middle of the agricultural country, and I was supposed to go back there in the fall. They just canceled it. It was one I could have driven to. I was kind of sad they canceled it. But they had this little summer camp, and they get these autistic kids, nonverbal ones, out on boats, zip lines, all kinds of stuff. And the parents would be so surprised and say, you got my kid on a boat? Yeah, we got him on a boat and it turned out he liked it. Now you're just talking about a little rowboat in the pond. But for that kid, that was really a big thing. You see, now that's something that he can do with other with other kids. Where it's a shared activity. Maybe it's, you know, I, I, we, we got to find out what he's capable of. You, you, you don't know until you work with them. 
The other thing, I had a really good behavior analyst tell me something really stupid that she saw somebody do. They were taking a nonverbal teenager and to teach him to set the table, they were making him set and unset the table 10 times. Then he got mad and threw the table at her. But nobody sets and unsets a table 10 times in a row. You set the table, then you eat. Teach it in the natural way that you would do it. Absolutely. They know the difference between real work and just dumb stuff. Mm -hmm. The other thing with some of the nonverbals where Tito talks about putting on a T-shirt. If you yank it on like that, he doesn't understand how the T-shirt works. But if you put it on really, really slow, and you kind of keep it all one more, then you very slow put the arm into the arm into the sleeve, then he understands. Makes a lot of sense. I love that. And these are things that, you know, you just do it really slow and you try to do it all in one motion, very slow. And I talk about that in the in the way I see it, in the way I see it book. I've got Tito's, uh, I've got it summarized, with some of the really important things. Um, what advice for an adult uh, child that is obsessing about bank accounts going back to their um, their home, living with parents during COVID. What, what do you mean about their bank account? Um, it says, what is what advice for an adult uh, child who is obsessing about bank accounts going back to their parents home? I don't know what he's doing with a bank account. I'm not sure either. Judy, are you able to explain a little more in the chat box if you don't mind? Yeah, that I way don't we can get your question what, answered. What that, what I really don't understand what that's about. Um, just a comment, um, Jenny says that you are an amazing advocate. That oh, was thank you very, very much. And uh, yeah, you see, I don't know what he's obsessing with. Now, I think when I was seven, I, I was given 50 cents a week for allowance, and I knew exactly what I could buy with that. Five comics, but if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. I was learning that at a very young age. I think that's kids aren't learning that sort of stuff today. Yeah. It's a good lesson to learn. Um, your best advice for parents and educators was a question asked. Well, that's very, very vague. I mean, a little kid, two and three years old, I can give you a standard answer on early intervention. But the biggest problem I'm seeing is there's a tendency to over shoulder and over protect these kids. Now, you don't just shove them into some noisy thing that's going to be sensory overload. You don't do that. But you've got to stretch to try new things. Just outside the comfort zone and give them choices. And I've heard where they got a kid out and get a job, and then he just kind of blossomed. But don't stick them on a, on a busy takeout window that's completely crazy with multitasking. That's what you don't do. You put them in a store that's quieter. And and uh, but you've got to stretch. There's a tendency. I'm seeing some parents where they can't let go. OK, you stop to get gas, have them run in and buy a drink. I was at the airport one time and parents come up and their 12 year old never bought anything. You know what I did? I pulled a five dollar bill out of my wallet and I said, go in that newsstand and buy something. And she came back with a drink and gave me the shame change. That's the first time she'd ever bought anything in a store. Hmm. And she found out she could do it. I did that in an airport. I don't remember what airport it was in. I just remember sitting in the newsstand was almost right across the hall. I could see the newsstand where I was sitting. And she went in and bought a drink and came back. You know, you could stop and buy gas. Pick the gas station where you actually can see in the window while you're pumping the gas. Send them in there to buy something. These basic things are not being learned. Those are great skills to learn. Well, yeah, yeah, that's stuff that I was doing as a real young kid. Yeah. Um, Angela says, thank you for the reminder of exposure to new things. Sometimes obsession and repetition for comfort and exhaustion takes over both him and myself. Well, this is where, you know, sometimes find somebody else to help you. You know, this is what some of the families are doing. You know, you've got a couple of families get together 
and they kind of make a little quarantine pod. Uh, this is where some of these moms, you got to get some help. I used to just say, go to your church groups, go to your community groups. But thought that's all shut down. All our churches are shut down completely. And and this, these were great places for kids to do volunteer jobs and learn how to how to do a task outside the family on a schedule where somebody else is the boss. Well, maybe you can have your kid walk somebody else's dog. There's a lot of gardening going on. We're going to have to find find some other things. Get a student to come in and help. And hopefully a student that's out, not out doing bars and getting exposed. But this is where some of these moms are going to have some help. Yeah. Great advice. Um, there's a question here or they're wondering if you could explain COVID. How do you explain COVID to kids? So right now at home, we are saying everything is canceled because people are sick. But once school starts, I'm worried they will be scared to go to school because they're afraid to get sick. Well, the weird thing about COVID, it's a really weird disease. Most people, it doesn't make them very sick. And OK, in the meat industry, you have a lot of problems with COVID. They go in and test 2000 employees in a plant. Half of them are positive. And only two people got really sick out of all those people at meat packing plant. And the reason why we have to be careful about it is older people like me have a much bigger chance of dying from COVID than children. Children actually aren't that likely to get sick. But the problem is the child has to make sure he doesn't bring it home to granny who's living in the same house. That's the that's the thing that's the worry because it kills granny, not most little kids are, are fine, except for there's a few that get this weird uh, inflammatory syndrome that is treatable. You start to see that emergency room like right now is treatable. They know how to treat that. Um, it's a very strange disease where most people that get it, it's, they don't get sick. Now, what they're learning right now is that there's crossover with coronaviruses that cause colds. Maybe the people that get really sick are the ones with such germaphobes they never got those common colds i don't know nobody's done the research on that but i um, and the problem is viruses you cannot see them you know and then you see pictures of the ball with the spikes that's what it looks like you know when you put it in a device where you can see it um but you take certain precautions what they've learned now it's mostly airborne i think it's 80 percent airborne in an enclosed space because even right here in Fort Collins, our people going rafting, they're not getting sick. And they don't social distance that well, but they're moving and they're outside. You know, in closed space, you're in a car with somebody, open all the windows. And then, of course, I go in the store, I went shopping. I've learned how to shop without touching anything in that store except the merchandise. And then, then when I went out, after I got my stuff, I take all my bags, put them on my sleeve like this, and then do hand, san hand sanitizer and go out the door. Then the, my car doesn't get contaminated. And if they don't have an automatic door, I back out. I push the door open with my back. And I'm not going to worry about COVID on my shirt. I've been, reading, I've been reading a lot of stuff and confined space. Look at cruise ship person. Meatpacking plant cafeteria. And they're probably getting it more there than they were on the processing floor. So it's something that it will eventually stop. But right now we've got to be careful, and especially to protect old people. Yeah. Tell the kid, they got to protect the, your grandmother from getting it. Because the other thing that's bad is you can have COVID and not know it. A whole lot of people have no symptoms. That's what they found testing meatpacking plants, cruise ship crews. Half the people don't hardly get any symptoms, but then they spread it around. And so, you know, the main reason you gotta be careful is so you don't give it to your, to your grandmother or some older person. Yeah, for sure. Because they're the ones that are more likely to have a severe case of it. Mm -hmm. 
Shirley, you had a couple more questions. Yeah. What do you say to adult to an adult child to reassure them about staying home and safe during COVID? He has his own apartment, but living with parent. Well, is he obeying the rules? That's a good question. Well, that's the first thing I want to ask. <laughs> is he actually obeying the rules? Judy, are you able to add that to the chat box? He may be fine. Lots of people on the autism spectrum, they're real sticklers for rules. And then when somebody else is not wearing a mask, they're going to yell at them. Yeah. You know, there's a thing what it calls societal norms. About 20 years ago in New York, they passed a rule that you had to pick up your dog poop. <laughs> and the police were out there enforcing it. You were getting $75 tickets for this. Do you know what? You live in New York right now and your dog poops and you don't pick it up. You'll get five people yelling at you. <laughs> it's not socially acceptable in New York to let your dog poop on the sidewalk and you don't pick it up. <laughs> and I remember when that got phased and it's now just a social norm. You pick it up. Okay, I think Judy, Judy responded back. Yes, he is staying at home with his parents, but so stressed about not going back to his own apartment. Oh, so he's not be allowed to be in his apartment. OK, well, maybe he's capable of being back at his apartment. Um, and he's a young person. The chances of getting very sick from COVID is low if the person's in their 20s. That, but the he's main 19. thing I'm concerned about a 20 year old is then they're careless and go spreading it all around. And then Grandma yeah. Kenny gets it. Or it's a lot more serious. You know, this is this where um, I'm seeing. OK, I can understand being more concerned about this, but I'm seeing things where kids aren't aren't learning shopping, just the basic stuff. Can we disable the camera of, of living in this apartment or not? I it's I'd have to have more information. Um, Shirley, you had another question. Yeah. I did. Sorry. Uh, did you have it, Shirley? Yep. OK. Um, thank you, Dr. Grandin, for advocating practical application for skill development through access to new things. As a person who encourages and invests in providing access to horses in a way to develop work goals and responsibility for themselves and others, you have long been an inspiration. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to hear you, uh, hear your common sense and obtain, uh, attainable suggestions. Well, you know, horses were a big part of my life when I was 15, 16 years old. I went away to a special boarding school, but I spent the first three years running the school's horse barn. I cleaned nine stalls every day, fed them, and put them in and out of the barn. And I, that, that was teaching work skills. Uh, what would you recommend for a non -verbal, what would you recommend for a nonverbal primary student who hits their parent when they go home, um, does not hit at school? So when he goes home, he's hitting. Okay. In other words, it, with this nonverbal student, um, he's good. At, uh, at school, but he hits the parents at home. Correct. All right. The first thing I want to find out is what are they doing at school? It's different. And this is where parents and the school need to be on the same wavelength. And they need to be working together as a team. That's the kind of thing where I get the teacher at school where he's behaving himself. Uh, and then find out what she's doing. And then you, you've got to have very consistent, you know, um, rules. And obviously the school's doing something right. And I'd have to ask a lot more questions. I've seen just the opposite, behave at home and horrible at school. Well, one thing my mother did is that she and, and the teachers at school, we were on the same wavelength. A temper tantrum at school was no television for one night, period. That was the rule and it was enforced. And fortunately, I didn't have a temper tantrum every day. It was maybe three of them a semester that were really bad. 
but you've got to find out what they're doing at the school. You know, you have to look at a whole lot of stuff. I can't answer it without getting more information, but obviously the school's doing something right and the parents aren't doing, the parent needs to learn something from the school. Another question is, um, or a comment, I love the message from your book, Use Your Strengths. It's very encouraging and refreshing and really makes sense. Well, and it, it's, I'm, um, you know, I look back at the people I worked with in the 80s and 90s when I was out on construction sites all the time, 20% of them easily would be special ed kids today. And you have things like a guy who owns a metal fabrication business who was saved by a single welding class. Now, I'm not saying welding is for everybody. It's not. But for this guy, it was ticket to a good career. Another kid, it might be music. It might be theater. But if those things aren't in the school, um, well, then the kid's not going to find out if he likes to do theater, which unfortunately is shut down now. Well, we're kind of getting near close to the end where I'm going to have to go. So I um, want to just, uh, you know, do the few class we got about, you know, I do have another appointment at 530. And we'll have to go. Mrs. Chalmers. I don't know where she's gone. Um, we had um, oh, some. Right. OK, go ahead, Shirley. Um, I thought there was my. I do have one more question. Okay. If my mouse would work here properly. Uh, my 14 year old son has trouble sleeping at night and staying awake at daytime. Have you experienced? Um, I lost it again. Yeah, well, the sleep issues, that's a real issue. Some kids' melatonin helps. The other thing is exercise. If I didn't do my burst of hard exercise every day, I would have more trouble with sleep. And that was her question I about melatonin. Yes. And even with COVID, I can still do my sit-ups. Mm -hmm. I do them on the bed, and then the modified push-ups I do on the, I put a towel down for my face and do them on the rug. Exercise that, is important. But I find that that exercise, if I don't do those exercises, then I have more trouble with sleeping. Now, you start an exercise program, it's going to take a couple of weeks for it to start to work. Because you've got to build up to the exercise slowly. You don't do 100 uh, sit-ups. Uh, I did five the first time. I thought I was going to croak. You have to work up slowly. Absolutely. Um, Miss Salki, the Jackie has said, Temple, thank you for um, knowledge, your knowledge that you've given through your books and numerous talks that you have provided over the years. It has been invaluable to our communities. Your recent book was very insightful. Thank you so much for being such a strong advocate. Well, I just want to see kids get out there and be everything that they can do. And there's a lot of um, nonverbal in individuals that are underestimated on what they can do. And and we got to look at what a, what a kid can do. I went to I've, I've been to a lot of therapeutic writing places and one of the mistakes that gets made is they don't differentiate between the client that's going to need a sidewalker to lead the horse like always and the person that could learn to ride independently. I also see that with um, uh, with job uh, things where for some individuals the bagging groceries or shelving groceries at a grocery store that's a great training job then they need to move on and then there's other individuals where that is an appropriate career and what i'm seeing that differentiation is not being made between where bagging groceries is a stepping stone to learn work skills where there'll be another client where it is an appropriate clear career Excellent. Um, now, we have um, 
we have a draw for a couple of books of uh, Temple's The Autistic Brain. It is a very, very, very good read. Um, and uh, Shirley was going to do a draw for that. Okay. I have Judy Scobie as a winner and Carrie Lance. So we will get your addresses and we will get it mailed out to you. And Carrie Wolf is our third winner for a book. So if, again, if you can send us your addresses, that would be great. And you can just put them in the chat box, please. And I have put a link in there for a survey. Um, if you would um, do the survey and let us know what your feedback is, that would be great. And Temple, we would love to um, to thank you for graciously joining us this evening. It was great. Thank you so much for having me. We are greatly appreciative. Okay. It's always a pleasure hearing you speak. You are a great inspiration to us all. We well, just love you. you very, very much. We do. We, we, we truly love you and, and respect you and we can't thank you enough. Well, thank you very much for um, having me tonight. That was um, really good. And I guess I'll just uh, leave the meeting now. All and right. Thank you. And uh, we will be in touch. You haven't oh, heard the last of us. Thank you so temple. much. Okay. <laughs> yep, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Temple. And thank you to everyone who came this evening. We uh, truly appreciate your support. And um, if there's any other questions or feedback, we uh, look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. I'm so glad you can all attend. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It was such an honor. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We are so glad you were able to make it. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, coming, Chris, and thanks for all your help with um, with our VLE since March. We appreciate it. There's more coming next week. So you guys have a wonderful evening. We look you forward too. to it. Thank you very much.